Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, and uh, welcome to this midweek Lenten worship service. My name is Pastor Daniel Sargent. I serve as the pastor at St. John in Grover, and it's my pleasure to be with you today. We'll begin this service with our opening hymn, which is hymn number 425, Go to Dark Gethsemane. We'll sing verses 1 through 3.
our sins to you and plead for your mercy. We acknowledge that sin runs too deep in our nature for us ever to rid ourselves of it. But we thank you that Jesus has done what we could not do, washing us clean of every stain. We plead that your Spirit would give us the strength to live a new life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. At this time, we continue with the Passion History of our Lord Jesus Christ, Lesson 4, Responsive Reading. As soon as it was day, the council of the elders of the people met together, both chief priests and experts in the law. They brought Jesus into their sanctuary and said, If you are the Christ, tell us. But he said to them, If I tell you, you will not believe. And if I ask you, you will not answer me or release me. But from now on, the Son of Man will be seated at the right hand of the power of God. They all said, Are you then the Son of God? He said to them, I am what you are saying. Then they said, why do we need any more testimony if we ourselves have heard it from his own mouth? Then the chief priests with the elders and the experts of the law, together with the whole Sanhedrin, reached a decision. They found Jesus, led him away, and handed him over to Pontius Pilate, the governor. Then when Judas, who had betrayed him, saw that Jesus was condemned, he felt remorse. He brought back the thirty pieces of silver to the chief priests and the elders and said, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. But they said, What is that to us? That's your problem. He threw the pieces of silver into the temple and left. Then he went off and he hanged himself. The chief priests took the pieces of silver and said, It's not lawful to put these into the treasury since it is blood money. They reached a decision to buy the potter's field with the money as a burial place for performance. So that field has been called the field of blood to this day. Then what was spoken through Jeremiah the prophet was fulfilled. They took the thirty pieces of silver, the price of the sons of Israel had set for him, and they gave them to the potter's field, just as the Lord commanded me. Early in the morning, the Jews led Jesus from Caiaphas to the Praetorium. They did not enter the Praetorium themselves, so they would not become ceremonially unclean. They wanted to be able to eat the Passover meal. So Pilate went out to them and said, What charge do you bring against this man? They answered him, If this man were not a criminal, we would not have him over to you. Pilate told them, Take him yourselves and judge him according to your law. The Jews said, It's not legal for us to put anyone to death. This happens so the statement Jesus had spoken, indicating what kind of death he was going to die, would be fulfilled. They began to accuse him, saying, We found that this fellow misleading our nation, forbidding the payment of taxes to Caesar, and saying that he himself is Christ, a king. Pilate asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? It is as you say, Jesus replied. The chief priests accused him of many things. When he was accused by the chief priests and the elders, he said, Answered nothing. Pilate questioned him again, 
Are you not going to answer anything? See how many charges they are bringing against you. But Jesus still did not answer anything. So Pilate was amazed. Pilate went back into the praetorium and summoned Jesus. He asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Are you saying this on your own, or did others tell you about me? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Your own people and chief priests handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus replied, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight so that I would not be handed over to the Jews. But now my kingdom is not from here. You are a king then, Pilate asked. Jesus answered, I am, as you say, a king. For this reason I was born, and for this reason I came into the world, to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. What is the truth, Pilate said to him. After he said this, he went out again to the Jews and told them, I find no basis for a charge against him. But they kept insisting, he serves up the people, teaching all from Judea, beginning from Galilee all the way to Judea. When Pilate heard this, he asked if the man was a Galilean. When he learned that he was under Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him to Herod, who was also in Jerusalem during those days. When Herod saw Jesus, he was very glad. For a long time he had wanted to see him, because he had heard many things about him. He hoped to see some miracle performed by him. He questioned him with many words, but Jesus gave him no answer. The chief priests and the experts in the law stood there, vehemently accusing him. There, along with the soldiers, treated him in contempt and ridiculed him, dressing him in bright clothes, Herod sent Jesus back to Pilate. Herod and Pilate became friends with each other on that day. Before this, they had been enemies of each other. We continue now with our next hymn, which is hymn number 408, He Stood Before the Court.
God's grace, mercy, and peace are yours. Found there on that hill just outside of Jerusalem called the skull. Jesus, there on the cross, God's mercy for us. Amen. The text we have for our message today is found in the Old Testament book of Job, chapter 40, verses 1 and 2, and then again, chapter 42, verses 1 through 6. The Lord responded to Job and said, Will the one who makes charges against the Almighty dare to correct him? The one who accuses God should make his case. Job responded to the Lord. He said, I know that you can do all things. No purpose of yours can be thwarted. You asked, Who is this who spreads darkness over my plans with his ignorant words? I have made statements about things I did not understand. Things too wonderful for me to know. You said, listen now and I will speak. I will ask you questions and you will inform me. My ear heard about you. My eyes see. So I despise myself. I repent in dust and ashes. My dear friends, have you ever been accused of doing something you did not do? It's painful. Accusations, especially when they're not true, can ruin reputations destroy relationships, and even bring down powerful politicians. A man named Job knew what it meant to be accused of something he did not do. His story of suffering is legendary. He lost all his livestock and servants, his wealth, in one day, all gone. And if that weren't bad enough, on that same day, his seven sons and three daughters were all celebrating in their house. A tornado destroyed the house, its walls collapsing in all of his children died. In one day he lost everything that was near and dear to him except his wife. And yet in the middle of all that suffering he fell to the ground and worshipped. It's recorded for us these words that Job said on that fateful day. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. Yes, he was devastated. Yet the scriptures say, in all this, Job did not sin by charging God with wrongdoing. But Job's ordeal wasn't over yet. Next, he was afflicted with a serious disease. Painful boils covered his body from the bottom of his feet to the top of his head. It was so painful that he couldn't sleep. The only way he could find relief was to take a piece of broken pottery and scrape his skin, sitting in a pile of ashes, hoping that the ash would somehow soothe the pain 
in his skin from those boils. And yet, through all that, Job remained strong. Even when his wife came to him and said, just curse God and die. But how did Job respond to the words of his wife? He said this, Shall we accept good from God and not trouble? Maybe you know what it's like to face one trial after another. They come like waves, crashing against us, sometimes to the point where we can't breathe. We feel almost overwhelmed. If you had been in Job's situation, what would you have done? What would you have said? The story of Job continues. His three friends come to visit him. And Job hopes that they're going to come with words of comfort and consolation. But once they open their mouths, everything goes downhill. His three friends come and they rationalize the situation they look at Job and they say, Job, you must have done something so terrible. You must have some sin that you are hiding from everyone else that is so bad that God is punishing you, accusing him of doing something wrong, something he had not done. Their attempt to comfort turn to accusations. And maybe in the middle of all of their conversations, Job began to doubt and to question. Tempted by the devil himself to question what God was allowing to happen. And Job cried out, God, if I have sinned, what have I done to you? You who see everything we do, why have you made me your target? Have I become a burden to you? Being tempted to give in to despair, what Job did right there was actually put God on trial. Accusing God of being unfair, unjust, unloving, uncaring. Job crossed the line. And this is one of the devil's favorite tools. His trick to get us. In fact, the devil's other name, Satan, actually means the accuser. He comes with his whisper when difficulties come our way, when we face trials. Is God really there for you? Does God really love you if he's allowing this to happen in your life? And sometimes the devil, Satan, will make us doubt and even question God, even with the simple statements that we say underneath, questioning, why, Lord, have I been sick for so long? Why, Lord, did you take that loved one from me? 
Why, Lord? Why me? In our impatience and in our doubt and sometimes even in our anger, we can put God on trial. God, this isn't fair. God, why? And that's exactly what Job was doing in our text. And how did God respond? God says, well, if you want to put me on the witness stand, and answer you. You better be prepared for me to ask you to take the stand. God says to Job, will the one who makes a charge against the Almighty dare to correct him? The one who accuses God make his case. God says, okay, you're going to confront me put me on trial, you better be prepared to take the witness stand yourself. And God goes on to confront Job. In chapter 42, he says, Job, where were you when I created the universe? Where were you when I said to the sea, that's as far as you can go, no further. Where were you when I placed the stars in the sky? Where were you when I called forth the rain from the clouds and the snow to fall on the mountains? Where were you when I created everything? You're just a man, and I am God. Brace yourself like a man. And I will ask you to answer. You've gone too far, Job. And how did Job respond? I know that you can do all things, God. No purpose of yours can be thwarted. You ask. Who is this who spreads darkness over my plans with his ignorant words? I made statements about things I didn't understand, things too wonderful for me to know. Job admitted that God was in control. God had his purpose. And he said, listen now and I will speak. I will ask you questions and you will inform me. Coming to his senses, Job said this, my ear heard about you, my eyes see you, so I despise myself. I repent in dust and ashes. The Lord put Job in his place, and that was a good place to be, a place where we should all be that place of repentance. When we accuse God, we have it backwards. We sinful human beings deserve to be put on trial and answer this question. Why should I not destroy you forever, God says. Why should I not destroy you forever? Job knew the answer, and so do we. Why? That answer has been inscribed on stone. It's been sung year after year, as a wonderful hymn, a testimony, the answer to that question, why? Job said, I know 
that my Redeemer lives, and that in the end he will stand on the earth, and after my skin has been destroyed, yet in my flesh I will see God, I myself and not an other. Oh, how my heart yearns within me, Job, through it all, clung to that truth. He knew his Redeemer would come, and yet he never knew his name. How blessed we are to know Jesus, our Redeemer. During this Lenten series, we've had the opportunity to see how people put God our Savior on trial. How he stood before Caiaphas, how he stood before Pilate, how he was brought before Herod, how the crowds accused him of blasphemy, how he was beaten, abused, stirred, and finally given the death sentence. And through it all, he did not accuse God of wrongdoing. No. Why? Because he carried the accusations that Satan had against you and me to the cross. He carried the guilt of our sin to the cross. He bore the punishment we deserved to answer that question, why should I not destroy you? And Jesus is the one who's standing there because I saved them with my life there on the cross. So when you suffer, when the pain doesn't go away, when you begin to doubt and question why it's happening, think of the story of Job. But not so much the man, Job, but our God, who was behind Job. As many of you know the story, the devil had come to God and said, let me, let me tempt Job, and he will curse you. And God said, go ahead and give it a try, knowing full well it would not work. Why? Because God was the one who kept him strong. Most of all, when we're tempted to accuse God, remember how Jesus took those accusations on himself. He who suffered knows how to sustain those who suffer. He who endured knows how to help us endure. The one who tells the sea to stop, the one who chains Satan and says, this far and no farther, the one who crushed the devil's head when he cried out it is finished there's no need to despair because in him we have the victory amen now to the eternal immortal invisible the only god we honor and glory forever and ever we continue now with our next hymn as our offerings are brought forward, hymn 405, on my heart imprint your image. <laughs>
join in the responsive prayer. O God, our Father, by your mercy and might, the world turns safely into darkness and returns again to light. We place into your hands our unfinished tasks, our unsolved problems, our unfulfilled hopes, knowing that only what you bless will prosper. Take your great love and protection. We commit each other and all those we love, knowing that you alone are our sure defender through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We join together in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. The blessing of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Please be seated as we close with the next hymn, hymn number 782.